We have three speakers. Have the first is Laurie Manchester, Associate Professor of History at Arizona State University, currently writing a monograph entitled The Real Russians Return, Repatriates from China to the USSR. Her publications on the topic include Repatriation, Repatriation to a Totalitarian Homeland, The Ambiguous Alterity of Russian Repatriates from China to the USSR, published in 2013 in Diaspora, a journal of transnational studies. The title of her paper today is The Emergence of New Variants of Russian National Identity in the Provinces, The Unification of Post-War Repatriates from China in Post-Soviet Russia. Okay, uh, good afternoon, good morning, whatever it is. I have jet lag. Um, okay, uh, in Omsk, Chelyabinsk, Novosibirsk, and Ekaterinburg, to this day, repatriates from China meet regularly. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, they have uh, registered official associations, they have open websites, and they have started publishing newsletters and journals. While informal networks of repatriates existed throughout the Soviet period, mainly it was repatriates who had already known each other in China that continued to get together. Few advertised the fact that they were from China in the Soviet period, and some hid this fact. This unification of repatriates, which has happened since the fall of the Soviet Union, has allowed them to, to form a collective identity, which I argue verges on being a distinct ethnicity. They see themselves as the true real Russians in distinction to what they call Soviet Russians, local Russians. And that's what I'll be calling them for this talk. Now, this collective identity is based on the city of Harbin, which was the capital of the unofficial capital of Russian China. Now, uh, Russian Harbin, of course, no longer exists, and bear with me, I know this is a conference on, on regions of Russia, you're gonna have to deal with some metaphysical understandings of this. So this province no longer exists, I argue, and they argue, that the province, which was actually never really a province of Imperial Russia, so we're really getting, getting uh, fantastical here, that it continues to exist within these repatriates to this day. Um, ethnic I, ethnic I, uh, identity often splinters when ethnic return migration occurs. This is a global phenomenon due to idealistic expectations and due to the belief that it will be a natural process. But in democratic countries, uh, what we've seen is that the problems that are caused by ethnic return migration are countered by public relations campaigns and self-help groups. None of this was available to repatriates to the Soviet Union. They were greeted with silence, uh, and locals in areas to which they, um, they were sent uh, were completely bewildered by these white Chinese, as they called them, who spoke perfect Russian. Repatriates stood out like sore thumbs. Uh, they were wearing the latest Western styles. Uh, they were wearing sunglasses, shorts, items that were simply not worn in the Soviet Union at that time. A few locals called them Belia Banditi, or traitors. Uh, even though not all of them had uh, ancestors who had uh, fought with the white army, uh, quite a few, uh, pretty much everybody had at least one ancestor who had been a, a, a Starozhilets who had lived in Manchuria before 1917 as part of the building of the CER railroad. Now, Russians and Chinese among the first wave uh, diasporas who constituted uh, uh, were unique in that uh, when those uh, people that, that uh, were evacuated or fled with the white army went to Manchuria and to Shanghai, there was already a Russian infrastructure waiting for them. Now this was also true of Russians who went to former parts of the Russian Empire that were not incorporated into the Soviet Union. The difference is that in those areas, uh, such as Bizarabia, the Baltics, Poland, uh, locals became increasingly anti-Russian, whereas in Manchuria at least, specifically in Harbin, Russians remained the dominant ethnicity and Russian institutions thrived until the early 1950s. So you could live in Harbin and not speak another language, 
um, and not have a problem. So Harbin really becomes this symbol for the emigration, and it has become a symbol in, in post-Soviet Russia for uh, this, this one place in the world after 1917 where pre-revolutionary Russia or Staria Russia was preserved. There were three waves of voluntary repatriates. The, the, the first group that left in 1935, about 20,000 Soviet citizens who uh, were, went to the Soviet Union after the railroad was sold to the Japanese. Uh, this was the tragic wave. Uh, most of the men were shot in 1937. Most of the women were arrested. The second wave was in 1947, and that was from Shanghai and Tianjin, from port cities. Uh, about 6,000 or half of the Russians living in those cities uh, repatriated. Uh, in 48, at least 10% of them were arrested. Uh, and most went to Sverdlovsk. The farthest west they could go was Kazan. Now the third wave, and this is the wave where I've done, I've done massive interviewing, about 80 interviews of repatriates. I've interviewed some from the first and second waves, but mainly uh, people from the, the third wave. The third wave started in 54 and ended roughly around 1960. And it was the largest wave of, uh, of ethnic return Russians uh, to, uh, to the Soviet Union, um, over 100,000. And these were the Manchurian Russians who had not been allowed, despite many having wanted to, had not been allowed to repatriate since 1935. Now, uh, none of this group uh, was repressed. I have found one woman who was arrested in 58 because she would not stop talking about how wonderful things had been in China and how terrible she found things in the Soviet Union. Um, now, initially, this group, specifically those who went from 54 to 56, which was the majority of them, went to the state farms, Selina, in uh, Kazakhstan, the Urals, and Siberia. Now, by the early 1950s, it was clear to the Russians in China that they couldn't stay in China. The Chinese didn't want them there. Uh, and in terms of understanding, there's, it's a complicated, I have a whole chapter on what the factors are for why they decide to repatriate and then how they, they interpret that. But the war, World War II, was the single most important factor, both for the second and third waivers. They feel most Russians in China felt this tremendous patriotism. For most, it's not a Soviet patriotism. It's not mixed with a belief in communism. It's this sense of the need to return to one's istarichiskaya rodina, to return to the homeland of their ancestors. But I should note vis-a-vis -vis Manchuria that there's this intense Sovietization of Manchuria that happens after 1945 when the Red Army either liberates or occupies, depending depending on uh, your perspective, Manchuria. Uh, when they come in, they arrest over 10,000 uh, people, mainly men, uh, and send them, uh, either shoot them or send them to the gulag. These men were, uh, some had collaborated with the Japanese, and, uh, and they were all sort of leaders of the immigration. Uh, then all immigrant schools are, are, are closed, and so that many of the people, the young people who were, say, in their 20s that I interview now, uh, were did not go to emigre schools. They went to Soviet schools using Soviet uh, textbooks. Uh, there were Soviet clubs where they saw Soviet films and cried because they wanted to become one um, with, with their narod. But it's also important to, to point out that churches stayed open throughout this period. The Soviets never tried to mess with the churches. They did arrest one bishop. Uh, but also capitalism continued to stay uh, legal and to uh, thrive. Um, but I do want to point out one thing, it's these young people that went to these Soviet uh, schools, they were usually the main initiator in the family. And in some cases, they would, when they became 16, they would go to the consul and say to their parents, I'm repatriating whether you want to or not. And so it was the older generation who uh, often reluctantly, and these were people who remembered pre-revolutionary Russia, remembered the revolution, who went with them um, in order to keep the family together. Okay, so there's this great joy at returning. People knew it was gonna be hard, and yet there's still this shock that occurs when they repatriate. Uh, in part, with the third waivers that came in the 50s, this is because they are sent to these state farms. Uh, most of them were city dwellers, and they're dealing with dirt floors, no electricity. In Kazakhstan, at the state farms, there was absolutely no housing waiting for them. They had to build it themselves. Luckily, they got there in the late summer and not in the winter. Um, and for the second waivers, they arrived in 47. They're immediately hit with the anti-cosmopolitan campaign. People think they're spies. Uh, neighbors are, are writing Danosi about them. 
Now, um, very few of those who went to the state farms in the 50s stayed on the state farms. They get out of there within a couple months and they are allowed to leave. And what we see is a phenomena of chain migration in many cases. For example, the city of Chelyabinsk in the Urals uh, has an enormous uh, uh, diaspora of Harbinsi. And what happened was the two guys who had been at the Harbin Polytechnical Institute and hadn't finished the course there, uh, managed to get to Chelyabinsk and roll there and they talked to the dean and said, hey, we've got all these friends that we were in school with and they're really great engineers like we are. And so he said, hey, have them come here. So literally two to three hundred fellow friends of theirs came to Chelyabinsk. So you have this Malinki Harbin, which continued to exist in Chelyabinsk. But again, these are people who knew each other before. All right, there's a major difference in terms of the ability to adapt or acculturate when one looks at the older generation and the younger generation. I'm not going to really talk about the older generation because they're mainly dead by the time Perestroika, Glasnost, the fall of the Soviet Union happens. I can only say that they didn't adapt. They basically lived in internal emigration. The youths, these young people who were around 20, who wanted to repatriate, among them, the ability to acculturate varies wildly. You have some people who immediately married local Russians, had happy marriages, and seemingly completely integrated into Soviet society. Then you have some who never socialized at all with someone who was not a repatriate, would not allow them through the door of their apartment, as uh, one couple told me. Now, the degree to which they acculturated depended on personality, character. It depended on gender. It was much harder for women than men to acculturate political leanings and religious, how religious you were. Uh, now, all the youths that came were able to, uh, to get a higher education. Many of them did very well career-wise, something they're very proud of. Uh, some were prevented from joining the party due to the fact that they were born in China. Uh, some refused to join the party. Some did, and it helped their careers tremendously. Now, these Siberian and Ural cities that I mentioned, where the majority of repatriates live, are where their ancestors, for the most part, lived before the revolution, and this is not an unimportant fact. In fact, you see family reunification in a number of cases. Uh, one family end up moving in, a, a man who was arrested in 45 gets out of the gulag in 56, and he moves in with his sister, whom he hadn't seen since 1920. They're living in the same house in Omsk where their family had lived for generations, and uh, his daughter, who I interviewed in that very same house, lives there to this day. There's another case in Omsk uh, which everybody talks about in the repatriate community, about an older woman who was standing in a food store in Omsk in the late 1950s, and she suddenly realized that her sister, her Radnaya sestra, was standing right next to her. She hadn't seen her sister since 1918. They hugged and kissed. A family reunion. Okay, there are some not happy stories as well. Uh, in one of these repatriate newsletters, and I should mention the newsletters often publish these short memoirs, and, and this is a memoir that's not so short, it's, it comes out in, in various, uh, uh, you know, there's a part one, part two, part three, it's serialized. Uh, one young man who did not want to repatriate wanted to go to Australia. His mother insisted they repatriate because she had to see her native Tumen again, Tumen. And uh, even though she, so she was, in 1955, they get there, they leave the state farm. She hadn't been there since 1918, and she wants to go see her friends, her family, and her gymnasium, right? And he writes very poignantly in the memoir how she simply walks the streets of Tumen weeping. She couldn't find a single person she knew. She couldn't recognize her gymnasium. All right, already in the Soviet period, we see in Samizdat publications and in correspondence, we see some repatriates voicing this sentiment that they are the real Russians. In a 1974 letter to a fellow, uh, a fellow repatriate summed up this otherness, and she's writing to one of her repatriate friends whom she knew from Kharbin. Quote, as I look around me, I realize that my views on life in general differ from the norm. It is hard to live surrounded by those whom I do not understand and who do not understand me. I don't know about you, but I miss here the traditions that pervaded our childhoods. Everything here is not that way. Here daily life is completely foreign to me. Russians are not what they were, and Russia is no longer the same. Now, after the, the fall of communism, suddenly these sentiments 
could be voiced in a semi-public forum, which are these repatriate newsletters and these associations. And it's important to point out that even those people who had seemingly assimilated, right, married local Russians, gone their separate ways, suddenly they're subscribing to these repatriate newsletters and they're showing up at these meetings. Now, um, in, 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 in one respect, these newsletters allow people to reconnect with friends and family. But what I want to really stress is they also allow people to make new friends. Because every time anybody publishes anything, and they don't just publish memoirs, they publish these philosophical tracts on what does it mean to be a Kharbinitz and, 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 and all sorts of, you know, what is Kharbin, what should it be to fu the future of Russia. But anyway, you have people putting their, if they have email, their email addresses, but putting their address and their phone numbers, and they contact one another and develop new friendships, often very close friendships, although because of the space of Russia, they never actually meet. Uh, one correspondence that I read, a, a woman who has opened her entire family archive to me and who she corresponded with pretty much everybody in the world. Uh, I had, you know, literally 10,000 letters from her. And uh, she corresponded with a man who had been taken in 1945, seized, uh, and lived in some village after 56 and had never met a single repatriate. He lived so far from them, married a local woman. And then he finds out about this newsletter, he subscribes and he likes an article she's written, so he writes to her. And I have 10 years of their correspondence in which he writes to her how it's been since 1945, he hasn't been able to share any of these feelings. She is a radnoy chelevek to him. He feels closer to her than he feels to his wife. Uh, and you know how he's been living inside of his head. So, so it's in this space that is that is made possible by these repatriate journals that uh, that you see this new ethnicity, if we want to call it that, and I know I'm verging on the absurd here, uh, but uh, this, this ethnicity, which they themselves often call an arotness, it's something I ask them when I interview them, um, that happens. Now, and, and the extent to which this othering of local Russians happens precisely after 1991, it's important to note this. Just a couple of weeks ago, I got a, a treasure trove of letters from the 1950s from several repatriates in the first few years, and they were young and enthusiastic and excited. And these are people I've interviewed, and they're now old and not so excited or enthusiastic. Anyway, reading their letters, you can sense how much they wanted to fit in, how they were picking up on the local jargon, pablatu, and like being proud that they had used these, these terms. And but then, in retrospect, looking back, you see when I interview them, and also when you read the repatriate newsletters, they're not proud of any of that, right? They're bringing up like homo sovieticus, right? And so all these traits that they're bringing up that, that, that differ them, that makes them different from local Russians, are these traits that are kind of produced by the Soviet system, right? So bribe taking, drinking, swearing, inhumanity, cutting people in line, ba bad manners, you know, None of this existed in Harbin, and of course they have this very idealized uh, vision of Harbin. And I sum up the traits that they see as characterizing the typical repatriate. And this is from a 1994 <laughs> newsletter from an autobiography. Quote, I am from a typical Russian family, which in its heart preserved the way of life, morals, and attitudes of pre-revolutionary Russia. Our entire life, the entire tenor of our family was structured around orthodoxy. Our family inculcated in us such traits as practical mindedness, steadfastness, decency, responsibility, humanity, industriousness, and lack of coddling. Now, with the physical destruction of Kharbin, which is most symbolized for repatriates by the actual destruction of Russian cemeteries uh, during the Chinese cultural uh, uh, revolution. What we see in the repatriate press is this actual rebuilding of Harbin. It's very common for repatriates when they're writing their memoirs to hand draw a map of their neighborhood. And of course there are maps of Harbin, but, but they draw a, the map and then they put in the ha who lived in each house. And you see lots of histories of every single institution, every school in Harbin, every parish has had its institutional history. And then people write in and say, oh, you forgot about this priest and you forgot about this person. So it's, it, it, it's an actual rebuilding of this Harbin, which as I've argued, they see is very much alive inside of themselves. Now this recreation of Russian Harbin has been much more successful 
in the provinces than it has been in Moscow, where there are also Harbinsi and a lot of Harbinsi from Central Asia who have moved there with uh, the destruction of the Soviet Union. Um, this may be because Harbin uh, was to them a province, so it makes sense to recreate Harbin in a province. Um, for example, in Moscow, the Shanghaitsi uh, meet separately from the Harbinsi, and God forbid you try to get the two together, I've tried. Um, whereas in Ekaterinburg, they have never met separately, even though the Harbinsi complain all the time that the Shanghaitsi like to sing English songs, and they say, oh, well, we were the real Russians because we didn't know English, and so we're better than them, and the, Harbin and the Shanghaitsi look down. But on the other hand, in Ekaterinburg, their newsletter is called Ruski Kitaya, and they don't have Manchuria in the title, and it's a way of connecting, and the editors of that newsletter, they They've always had one who's from Shanghai and one who's from Harbin, and now the newsletter is, sh is shutting down because the Shanghaitsi are almost completely gone. There is also, though, an important split in Moscow among the Harbinsi. And I would argue that Memorial, uh, an outside institution, and I can get asked in the question and answers about where the other uh, the people in the provinces meet, because there you see local institutions not playing the kind of heavy-handed role that I see Memorial has played. In, in uh, Moscow, Memorial, of course, is interested in the repressed. And they're, and they're not really interested in the white Russian immigration, right? There's some, there's some interesting politics here. So they're interested in these people who were communists and then have spent time in, in the camps. And Memorial conducted its, its own interviews with Harbin Si uh, years ago. And, uh, and, and when I read these interviews, I've read the transcripts, they ask these incredible leading questions, right? Which you're not supposed to ask when you're interviewing. Like, you know, they ask some woman from, who left in 35 and is like 98 years old, They ask her, you know, did you know that the white Russians look down on you and that there's a split? And she's like, wow, I never thought about it like this. And so suddenly, like, this split is created, right? So, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the red wave and there's the white wave. And, of course, it's ridiculous because pretty much anybody who left in the 50s had a family member who left in 35. Many of those who left in the 50s had fathers or brothers taken in 45. You know, the Starozhili, as I've already mentioned, intermarried with the right Russians. Uh, so I see this as an artificial... Uh, but I think it also has something to do with Moscow being so much more politicized, right, than the provinces um, in this sort of avert, in-your-face type of way. Okay, in conclusion, repatriates would argue that Russian Harbin is the model of what a future post-Soviet Russia should be. They don't feel like that has gotten much attention. Uh, I would argue it's gotten more attention than they think. I mean, I have a whole chapter in my book on how, how local Russians look at them. Um, but they feel like they're the last of the Mohicans. Now, once they realized that Russia was not, or that the USSR was not old Russia, they practiced what uh, Svetlana Boyum has coined a uh, restorative nostalgia. I, I find in their stories, to some extent, um, a mission of internal colonization, where they tried to teach people about orthodoxy, where they tried to teach people about pre-revolutionary traditions. And I would argue this is linked to the mission of, of Russia abroad. One of its main missions was to preserve the culture of pre-revolutionary Russia and bring it home to a Uh, non-communist Russia. But this mission is also similar to the relationship between the intelligentsia and the Narod before uh, 1917. And of course the irony is, is that most of the people I interview and most of the Russians that were in China uh, were of peasant background. So ironically this time that they spent in Russia abroad has transformed them into an elite uh, and has led them to see themselves as such. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me first thank uh, Edith and uh, the organizers of this conference. And it's going to sound a little bit like a backwards compliment, but I really do mean it. Um, I had originally had a title in addition that was um, uh, in front of the diversity uh, contingency and legacy that was uh, called Straining for Federalism. It fits very well with what just came before, and the idea was that there are very many different kinds of balancing um, uh, forces pulling uh, away and towards Moscow. But I've decided to change my title because I really think in terms of the themes of this conference and in terms of what I'm really trying to say, galvanizing nostalgia, question mark, is also extremely appropriate. And one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do here, and I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to talk this, this through is a three-way comparison of three uh, different major republics in Far East and, uh, and Siberia. Uh, and the three republics, uh, very major in terms of geographical space and in terms of their own psychology for the idea of what's a periphery and what's a center, because they feel themselves to be centers of their own worlds, um, are, are uh, Yakutia, Saha Republic, uh, the size of undisputed India, uh, Buryatia, about the size of Finland, or though if it were greater Buryatia, and here you do see these two satellite regions still there, although they've been abolished, as we just heard, and uh, Tuva, or Tiva, as they call themselves, about the size of, of England. Uh, and they could be a lot larger as well because they had territory formerly, the Urochai Krai, before they came into the Soviet Union. So they have a number of things in common, and one of the things that's important here to think about is both what's in common and what's, what's uh, different. One of the themes that I'm, that I'm hoping to bring up has to do with the importance of the northern regions. In this slide, the north is all the white, and look how big it is in all of Russia. I'm uh, appreciative to my friend Timothy Helenyak, who, geographer, who gave me the slide. And note that Tuva in, is still here uh, in these regions of the north. It's because these are the very most heavily subsidized regions in Russia. Um, we do have another issue to, to frame this discussion, and that is the importance of whether you have a republic or not. Um, this slide comes from RIPON, the Russian Association for the Indigenous Peoples of the North. And one of the important things here is that demography matters. If you're under 50,000, then you're an indigenous people within RIPON, but you don't have your own republic. And then the larger w peoples who do have their own republics are in um, another position. And here, I want to begin my uh, talk from the Saha Republic point of view, uh, or from the point of view of many different peoples inside of Saha Republic, by talking about a principle. I'm thinking of Saha Republic, Yakutia, uh, as an area that's rich and pivotal. This is, this is a major overarching theme, and the point as well in all of my comparisons as I've been trying to work them through, and this is partly uh, originally done for a, a project for a Treadgold lecture at University of Washington, and I'm still in process trying to work it through as a book. But one of the most important points of it is the issue of crystallization through certain kinds of moments in history. I started doing field work, and I've been going back and forth in all three republics uh, for a while, but especially Saha Republic, in 1986. And the Saha are very proud that they had one of the first demonstrations um, within the Soviet period as Gorbachev's Glasnost and Perestroika were starting. And this slide is a sort of stand-in, because this is where a brawl happened an inter-ethnic brawl. Now here you have children playing on the ice, but in exactly the same ice place near the university in 1986, uh, a, a pretty serious brawl broke out. And the next couple of days after no one had been ar arrested and Russian toughs had supposedly beaten up on Yakutsk University students, a whole bunch, uh, hundreds of, of Saha students marched down Lenin Prospect to Lenin Square and demanded to see the chief of police. Uh, and this was a crystallizing, polarizing moment. Uh, now you can pull back for such moments, and of course people, people did, but the students, some of the leaders were arrested, some were expelled, um, and it became very much a kind of legend in the Saha discourse about what was going on in inter-ethnic relations. The students were actually just asking that Perestroika and Glasnost could come to them. The next uh, slide is what happened a few weeks later. Uh, uh, most of the photographs I've taken myself, this was taken uh, in 86, and it's the May Day Parade. And this is the university students marching past the podium, um, uh, glory, glory to the Brotherhood of the Peoples. Uh, they had been accused of being ungrateful nationalists, and so here they were saying, no, no, 
Brotherhood of the Peoples really is important. Now, here are some other slides from that time period and then another time. Um, I, t I tend to take these pictures with horses and apartment buildings um, <laughs> fairly frequently, but this, this one is in the capital, Yakutsk. Um, and here I get to the importance of community building and other kinds of ways of national identity, more positive ways. Uh, this is a man, Andrei uh, Borisov, who became the uh, Minister of Culture, long running. He only just stepped down, but he, he started being Minister of Culture just after the Soviet Union broke up. Uh, and he is a theater director by background. And one of the most amazing things that he's done, in addition to galvanizing the Summer Solstice Festival, is the importance of of uh, having an uh, enormously lively theater. And one of the, one of the plays that just uh, well showed within the last five years in cycles, starting in 2010, was a show that was important for the history of repression. There had been an entire Saha family and all of their associates called the Ksenofontovs. And in a Ksenofont of Shina, they had been destroyed. This is several hundred peoples, probably upwards towards 400, had been arrested. Now, there were other groups that were arrested in even larger numbers, but this became a kind of symbol of what some Saha were calling eliticide. And when I saw the premiere of this play, and when I saw everybody reacting to it, um, it was one of the most astonishing moments. I was sitting with one of the people I've done field work with and I've co-authored things with, and her name is, is Uliana Vinokurova, and she taught me a Greek word. She said, this is a Gregor. This is an egregor moment, a moment of crystallization of the joy of our coming together, a community. So Andre has done this in part also with these festivals. Here's another shot. Andre looks a little bit more like a British colonialist here. Uh, <laughs> but running the show and also the formal opening of this celebration of summer, which you can imagine is important in Saha Republic, um, is the, the white shaman. Now here at the festival are our symbolic presidents. The first president of the Republic, Nikolaev here, is in suit, he's secure enough, he's Saha, he speaks Saha, there's no problem. The second uh, president over here is uh, a diamond magnet, his name is Shtirov, and he maybe was born in Saha Republic, maybe not. Uh, it's been debated in terms of his biography, but whatever, the family left early, and he's Russian, so he's wearing the traditional dress. Now, he's a diamond magnet. This is the second biggest diamond pit in, uh, in the world. Uh, it's uh, important to note that Saha Republic has uh, about 90% of Russia's diamonds, uh, that this has been enormously important. And one of the other very serious crystallizing moments that I witnessed, that I was extraordinarily uh, kind of aware of and party to, was the abrogation of the bilateral treaty for Saha, where they had been got, given, they had negotiated over a number of years, 30% of the diamond profits to go back into the development of, of the Republic. And when I say I've witnessed this, I felt it, it's because I was sitting in the office of Ulyana Vinokurova in the Saha parliament, and I watched as all sorts of deputies came trooping through her office, complaining in the most polarizing, angry language, the first time I had ever in my life heard Saha talk about separatism. I had never heard that ever discussed in any way. And I saw the bitterness and the anger because they felt that they had negotiated something important. I know that from other points of view, people call this a parade of sovereignties and felt very threatened by it. But for them, it was very much part of their presence inside something that they thought was a genuine Russian Federation. And when it was abrogated in, 19, uh, in, in 2000, when, when President Putin came to power, just as he was coming to power, people realized that this could be really serious trouble for the republic. Uh, and uh, they'd been a, a donor republic, they felt they had given enough back, and they felt very, very aggrieved. 
Now, several days later, a number of people, including Saha lawyers, started talking about the fact that this had been a bilateral treaty that was temporary anyway. It would have to be renegotiated. The polarizing language stopped. So again, they pulled back from the brink of, of real chauvinist nationalist discourse, but only just the damage was done. Here, I'm talking also about the importance of community and ecology activism. So let me do this very quickly. There are uh, enormous numbers of development projects beyond diamond mining. There's a pipeline where three oil spills have occurred in the Lena River. Save the Lena campaign is one where Saha and Russians are together. Uh, and indeed, there is even an organization that is called Mui Yakutyali. It's a multi-ethnic group. Um, and so this is part of that ecology campaign. Here's some other shots of it. And of course, the other part of this whole story for ecology is the importance of what global climate change has been doing. The Republic has very much felt it. The flooding has gotten worse and worse, although there is a zigzag pattern. And uh, this is simply a shot of, of something that happens all too often in the spring, but even more so recently. Um, here is the third president of the Saha Republic, very much in pomp and circumstance, Igor Borisov. Borisov had uh, uh, very much a, a, a party and official background. He's an appointee. And yet he very much had his inauguration, shall we say, with, with Saha symbolism. Um, he's one of the people who has also been very concerned about ecology at the same time he's trying to get certain kinds of sustainable de development projects going. And so that balance is very tricky. Here's another slide that indicates the importance of the connectedness of Saha to the land. And here I get into some of the spiritual revitalization movement things that have been happening. Um, one uh, Saha woman is... Uh, calling this not only laughter therapy, but laughter therapy in a field. And they have a kind of chant. I was with this group where they were chanting, I am Saha, I am here, I am here, in and with the land. So the connectedness to the homeland is important. This is the city version of a new temple. It's a shamanic temple called House of Purification. And my last Saha slide overlooking the, uh, the river valley where, uh, it's a very sacred river valley where uh, Yakutsk is actually doing an enormous amount of pollution. Uh, I want to go on very quickly. I, I, since we've had the Boreat example, I don't need to do it as much. Uh, and so very briefly, I'm just going to slide, um, pass through my, my slides. Um, east and West matters a lot in terms of degrees of Boreatization and Russification in this region. And so um, East and West uh, Baikal also show it, although there's been some development in Eastern Baikal and as, as well. This is kind of a, a, a tricky slide, a stand-in to show the dis the, the less developed nature. But one of the important things that's been going on is Buryat resentment about those two regions that we already, both of us, have mentioned that, that got dissolved. Well, they got dissolved in what was called last night a kind of Potemkin referendum. I love that, that phrase. Uh, and, and the idea in, in 2006 and 2008 was that the people themselves were convinced that uh, bigger is better and, and it will be uh, more economically efficient. But this is a one woman, she happens to be an ethnographer, uh, a protest, and you can't quite maybe see her her, her banner, but it says return the regions to the Buryats. Um, there is Language Day celebration to go with, with uh, uh, Kay's presentation. And uh, in, indeed, during that uh, last one that they had, uh, the president, the new president, who's a music composer, uh, Nagovitsin, uh, did address the crowd with a little bit of Buryat. Um, but protests have been very important here in terms of like Baikal, the sacred Baikal. And what's fascinating about this issue is that it is both a, uh, a, a Saha and a, a, a 
a Buryat symbol. In other words, it, it, how can Baikal be both a national symbol for Russians and, uh, and, and for Buryat? That's amazing. Now, I don't mean Saha, I mean Russians. So here we have protests in Irkutsk uh, that I happened to catch in 2005, um, both Buryats and, and, uh, and uh, Russians involved. And here, no to the pipeline around Baikal. Um, one of the other important parts of this, of course, the, the Buddhist identity, is the revival and worship at the monastery Volga of uh, a, a mummy who had um, foreseen Soviet repression, had put himself into a kind of mummified state, and then was um, checked on every once in a while, but came back out. This is Itagilov, and if you want to follow back up on it, it's an amazing story. But here he is in pomp and circumstance since 2003, one of the centers of Buryat identity and community. Now here, instead of the Buddhism side of things, we have the revival of shamanism. And there, there's a group called Tengri, uh, and those, fo those folks and others have been very, very much part of the, uh, the important revival of connectedness to the land, the woman right here, this is 27 unprecedented ritual where 27 um, Buryat shamans were going into trance. So here, this particular woman is from Mongolia and the Mongolic connections are there. There's also in, in the, uh, the 1990s, a Buryat Mongol People's Party. Um, so here, just more shots of that ceremony, worshiping a mountain deity spirit. And did I mention animal sacrifice? This is the last side of, of Buryatia. Uh, this is uh, the sacred Okhan Island. And here we go to Tuva. And very, very briefly, the Tuvan accession to Russia, the same kind of celebration. I'm calling these ritualized gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> There's a kind of idea behind these ceremonies of, of uh, frankly, uh, adapting history at best, because this was supposed to be the 100th year anniversary just in 2014, um, with um, obviously President Putin and the uh, Tuvan uh, native son done well, who's become the Minister of Defense, Shoigu. And here's, here's Shoigu at a, at a temple. And very briefly, uh, Bill Chide, who is a fascinating story in itself, because Bill Chide was uh, the head of a party that called itself Free Tuva, Hastuk Tuva, which was in the 1990s a fairly active and popular uh, uh, party. And he pulled back as he became more establishment responsible and head of parliament. So he's head of, of, of the Grand Coral for many, many years and then went back to academia. He was in charge of that 100-year celebration. So you could see how, how complicated this gets in terms of the, um, the dynamics of accommodation. He's looking at the um, Dalai Lama photograph. Here's the picture of the stamps from Tuva when they were actually uh, semi-independent because Tuva didn't come in to uh, the Soviet Union until 1944, right around the same time as the Baltic states. So this is uh, uh, extraordinary in terms of their own self-definition. Another important part of this story, and I don't have much time to tell it, is that uh, this slide kind of represents the uh, restless youth. One of the lesser known inter-ethnic conflict issues, one of the most serious events that kind of got buried in the process and chaos of the 1990s, was that there were serious inter-ethnic conflagrations in Tuva. In Tuva. Uh, in, in the early 1990s, in 1990 itself, um, messages put under Russian doors get out in the months. Uh, a conflict in the cobalt plant in the town of Khouaksi. Um, and young people complaining about issues of unemployment and their um, 
futureless future. So there, there became a serious issue. This monument is the, the center of Asia. People were saying, how could we at the center of Asia be treated so badly? And frankly, over 10,000 refugees resulted from that conflagration. I don't have time to go into the details of all the reasons behind it. It was a kind of perfect storm of things going wrong in terms of what happened. And trying to pull back from that has become incredibly important. Um, part of the pullback in the cultural revitalization, more positive side, has been a Buddhist revival here and here and here. Um, this is the sixth humble lama. Um, he just put his cell phone away. Um, he was complaining that Chinese pressure had created a situation where the, um, the uh, Dalai Lama was not allowed to come uh, again. He had blessed some of the, uh, the temples and the beginnings of revitalization. Um, this is the seventh Humbo Lama, just last fall, just in, 19, uh, in 2014, the, the, uh, the young Humbo Lama was uh, elected, succeeded the other after he died, and an enormous amount of circumstance, of, of ritual, of exuberance uh, went around this particular ritual. He's been trained um, in uh, Buddhist communities in India for uh, many, many years before he came back. Um, and then there is also a shamanic uh, revival with ecology orientation. This is Kinan Lapsam. Uh, this is uh, one of the healing centers. There are several competing ones with uh, his protege, Ai Churek. This is more her publicity photograph. I didn't take this one. And uh, another example of uh, the kind of thing we heard about from Karolenko last night, uh, this is a Russian woman who's become a shaman, so two of them Russian shaman. Um, I want to conclude by saying, first of all, um, that uh, we should understand that sometimes federalism is defined differently in different places. It means something different for, for Moscow administrators and for, for uh, local folks. And it, tasting degrees of sovereignty uh, can be um, incredibly empowering, but when they're pulled back, they become very polarizing. One of the things that's been going on, and the Russian sociologist Leokadia Drobizhova has been talking about this, is sometimes the polarization starts from Moscow. In other words, uh, Moscow policies have created a situation, for instance, the bilateral treaty abrogations, um, where uh, people were claimed to be more nationalistic than they actually were and became more polarized in the dynamic. Uh, regions uh, have developed, and I think it's not an accident, as they say, not an accident, comrades, uh, very pragmatic republic leaders emerging by necessity buffeted. Prasenjit Dwara, Chinese historian, has called a lot of the back and forth of inter-ethnic relations hard and soft boundaries. These are issues where it is a lot harder to get back to soft boundaries once they've been hardened or polarized. Ethnic entrepreneur discourse, of course, does not exist in a vacuum. You can't have an ethnic entrepreneur without some resonance in the community. And um, conditions feed this resonance. Losing sovereignty that you have tasted often triggers polarization. Boundaries clearly matter. And here I'm talking about boundaries on the ground. Um, there are various legacies. We've seen Boriatia gerrymandered. We've seen that Tuva, Tuva was once in, uh, semi-independent. Uh, Saha itself was once larger as Yakutia Gubernia. They were wise enough not to try to claim any further territory. Names matter, the titular republics. Appetites for sovereignty have grown, but within reason and within limits. Comparative activism, they all three have enormous uh, ecology movements, but it differentially, uh, Tiva a little bit less than the others and language issues to play out in different ways. Demography proportions matter enormously. The Tevans are four-fifths of their republic. Saha have only just regained half of their republic, although the census bizarrely, just this last census, had them at 49.5, which is some sort of psychological threshold. It doesn't look like a real number to me. 
Boreats are one third in their own republic and many live outside their republic. And now in conclusion, I would like to say that there are different kinds of nostalgias, and this goes very well with other themes that the panel has developed. There's romantic nostalgia, the kind that uh, valorizes epics or that is indicated by the Saha Republic seal that is in your program, was done on the basis of a petroglyph. Um, and then there's galvanizing nostalgia, and that's the kind that I have been trying to focus on and especially is illustrated by the ecology movements. Thank you. Thank you.